Good afternoon, young ladies and gentlemen. My name is King Ao, Executive Director of the Financial Services Development Council, or known as the FSDC. Well, many thanks for joining our talk today. I also want to welcome our two distinguished speakers, Mr. Barry Chen from China International Capital Corporation and Mr. David Lau from JP Morgan. Well, I hope you all have had a good start to the year and to make it even more fruitful I'm pleased to let you know that FSDC has refreshed our talent development initiatives. I hope you all uh, will be excited by this. Some of the non-freshmen among you may already be familiar with the activities that we have launched, such as the Practitioner Speakers Series, as well as the FSDC Career Day and job shadowing sessions. As we continuously hear positive feedback about these initiatives, that can help students better understand the career prospect of the financial service industry. We've made some enhancements to the program as follows. Firstly, in hopes of benefiting a wider group of audience in a more structured manner, our practitioner speaker series, or the PSS, are now open to all students of our partnering universities and young industry practitioners. The PSS will be sector specific Starting with this inaugural session on investment banking, and there will be more talks on many disciplines such as asset management and insurance, just to name a couple. Now, in every session, we will invite seasoned industry experts to share their insights and firsthand experience about what the sector does. All you need to do is to sign up by the enrollment link circulated by your universities and associations. Well, for those who have signed up for the PSS, you'll be eligible for a ticket to our new initiative of the year, Fireside Chat with Headhunters and Industry Practitioners, who will share with you about career planning services, uh, advice uh, ranging from job application covering letter and CV to interview. Again, this is going to be sector specific. Of course, once you grasp these useful tips, it is important to try getting first-hand industry exposures. On this note, I'm pleased to say that we are making our job sharing session a regular program after the encouraging responses to our pilot run last year. Successful applicants can shadow senior management and executives of selected financial institutions for a day. They will be able to gain a good understanding of various job functions in the chosen financial sector. We hope you are as excited as we are about these different new initiatives. And as always, we're happy to hear your feedback and about how we can help in your pursuit of a career in the financial services industry. You can check out the latest details and updates of our initiatives, including application methods and timeline through our social media channels. Last but not least, we love to listen to your views. So please do provide us with your brilliant suggestions. Now, without further ado, let us begin our long-awaited talk by Barry and David. My colleague, uh, Rocky Tong, will moderate this informative panel. Please, Rocky. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, King, and welcome to um, our FSDC uh, PSS, Professional uh, Practitioner Speaker Series. My name is Rocky Tong, and I'm ha Head of Policy Research here at the FSDC. Uh, joining me today um, at this session are two very senior investment bankers. One, uh, we have Barry, uh, who is the Head of um, Investment Banking with CICC, a leading player not only here in Hong Kong, but also um, in the Greater China region. Uh, also uh, uh, with us is Mr. David Lau. David is the head of global investment banking with JB Morgan. I'm sure many of you are aware of what JB Morgan is and where it is from. Um, obviously, uh, Barry is oh, uh, sorry, no, but David is also uh, very involved in our other work uh, in relation to policy research as a member with the policy research committee. So uh, without further ado, I would like to first float a question, and this is a very exciting one. Um, Barry and David, uh, perhaps you know, in that specific order, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your career, 
We all know that you are the head of investment banking with your respective firms. I uh, just wonder how it started, uh, what you did before, uh, you know, like this job and, you know, how it really began uh, as a fresh graduate. So perhaps, Barry, you can start, uh, you can start first. You really want to do it first? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I can. Um, okay, so uh, I... Uh, I started my career not in investment banking. I started my career with private equity and it was many, many years ago. Uh, and then uh, I really switched from private equity into investment banking in 1997. And at that time I joined a company called Jardin Fleming, which yeah. um, I, I believe many of you may not know that company, but it was a very active investment bank uh, in the nineties. Um, and it merged into JP Morgan in the year 2000. So, and I've been with um, JP Morgan ever since. In fact, uh, I spent a few years at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, I think uh, between 2002 and 2005. And uh, I actually worked with Barry together. Uh, we were colleagues at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So after that, I came back to JP Morgan uh, and uh, I have been uh, doing uh, investment banking ever since. And right now I run the uh, Hong Kong and China investment banking at JP Morgan, but we call it, uh, we just call it China because mm -hmm. Hong Kong is China. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Barry? Okay, time. thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, Rocky having us um, to have this session of sharing with our, our, our fellow student. Um, I just noticed that um, David, our path has crossed at least twice in, in our career. Uh, I started more traditionally as a trainee in the Standard Charter Bank, um, again, many, many years ago. Uh, and then I start, then I worked um, from, uh, at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, um, a listing division, uh, in the 94 to 97. And I, after which I moved to a listed company called Guangdong Investment Group. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you may heard about that. Um, in 1998, there was a Asian financial crisis. Then we were there to do all this uh, debt restructuring. I guess we first. I first met with David when I was in the Gold Investment, and probably Jordan family has also been helping in the restructuring. Um, and then we met in the exchange, more like a romance story. <laughs> in the house of exchange, um, um, again. Um, then I. We joined the exchange again, which is quite like um, what David did. He left Jardin and then Jardin Farming and we joined this, um, JP Morgan. I left the exchange, joined the listed company, and we joined the exchange again uh, in 2002. I worked there for another eight years before I left in 2010 and uh, joined CICC now here. Uh, now I have a 10 years here in, in CICC, um, being the head of investment banking of CICC Hong Kong. I'm in charge of all those. Um, I mentioned banking activities of CICC here in Hong Kong. Um, what we say Hong Kong, quite unlike um, what they said about this great China, because uh, in fact, we, uh, the work we did, we did cover all this um, um, Chinese company, um, mm -hmm. sitting for listing here in Hong Kong, as well as others, um, uh, Asian company, which also seeking for a listing here in Hong Kong. But apart from listing, I think we have other activities, including M&A and that and so forth. Maybe in a later part, we can touch on and what we do as bankers here uh, in Hong Kong. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, like we would love to know more. Um, but before that, I would like to uh, ask a couple of questions that the um, students may be very interested in. And that is, what did you study when you were in college? I'm sure, you know, like uh, students who are interested in investment banking may be interested in learning a little bit more about the subjects that you study when you were in college so that, you know, perhaps they can prepare a little bit better for uh, that specific positions and opportunities in the banking um, industry. So uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, like what you study when you were in school. Um, okay. David? <laughs> sure, sure. No, um, it wasn't a straight path for me. Um, I actually started with uh, pre-med when I was in college. I did uh, more than two years of pre-med, but then given a lot of different reasons, I switched from pre-med into economics. Mm. Uh, so my, I graduated in economics. That's what my you know, certificate uh, says um, on my certificate. So I graduated from economics. And then um, as I mentioned earlier, I went into private equity and then into investment banking. 
Now, uh, that's how I started. But I think the one thing that uh, we do these days is we welcome students from many different disciplines uh, into investment banking. Uh, we cherish the fact that uh, people from different majors or background would be able to contribute different views into the organization. Uh, so I think nowadays we are taking a lot of students with a diverse set of background or majors or degrees. Some of them could be engineering, some of them could be uh, history, some of them could be uh, uh, computer science, and then obviously many of them are in uh, finance. So we take in a lot of di different students with different backgrounds. But I think one thing that is quite important is it doesn't matter uh, what your major is, some sort of finance knowledge or background is important uh, mm -hmm. for us to consider um, any candidates. Oh, true. Um, you know, absolutely. You know, that sounds to me that, you know, there's no clear preference as to what kind of subject uh, um, that, you know, a student studies, but rather, you know, it's the personality and other characters, uh, you know, and, and perhaps, you know, we can go into further detail later. Barry, um, share with us, you know, like your uh, academic career before be becoming a very senior banker. I didn't have that kind of um, interesting um, uh, study as uh, David had. Um, I studied finance. Uh, in the university, I got my bachelor as a master degree, both in finance, because it's very boring. And in fact, um, if you say that, um, um, maybe the, I agree with uh, David that um, we see more diversity about the background of our colleague coming in. Um, very long time ago, people may, with a lot of us coming uh, as a banking industry, um, with majoring or studies in finance, economics, um, accounting, that kind of um, majoring. But um, uh, more recently, we saw more people, more students who um, come to CICC, especially for those um, um, university graduate uh, with different um, um, majors, including uh, uh, engineering, um, environmental science, uh, even biochemistry, aerospace, architectures. Um, that's the majors that I saw uh, recently in, in the last batch of students joining CICC as a chemistry could. Um, but having said that, most of them also try to get the second degree um, in like management or economics, um, that kind of mixture. And I think Rocky had the chance to talk about that. Our CEO and our COO, in fact, they are physics major students when mm -hmm. they study in the university. <laughs> Very interesting indeed. You know. Um... I have to mention, now that you mentioned physics, I just have to mention that our executive director, Dr. King out, he actually got his undergraduate and a, a doctorate degree in um, physics as well. So, you know, like that really tells you how uh, the industry and, you know, he has 35 years under his belt in the asset wealth management industry. So uh, just to tell you how uh, diverse uh, background uh, uh, that the students and the practitioners have uh, before joining us uh, as uh, practitioners. And myself, really, uh, I was uh, very much like uh, David. I had a pre-dentistry degree uh, to start with, uh, well, a pre-dentistry concentration to start with before turning uh, it, uh, to economics and then got my second degree there too. Anyway, uh, enough about myself. Uh, now we go to the core of this, and this is, this is about the industry. So investment banking is obviously something of interest to many uh, students. Uh, Hong Kong is also, uh, you know, like a key beneficiary of a thriving uh, investment banking industry. For that, you know, in, in the past 12 years, Hong Kong was the number one capital formation market globally, really, uh, globally in, in, uh, for 70, uh, seven years out of the past 12 years. So uh, investment banking professionals like your good selves have contributed a lot to this success. Um, but you know, it's not just the two of you. Uh, you have an army of uh, practitioners uh, working together with you too. So I would like to see uh, if you can perhaps highlight some of the um, roles and functions um, uh, that are available in the industry so that you know, like our students in the audience would be able to uh, get a better understanding of this. Now, um, if I may, Barry, I, I, I can't let you answer all the questions uh, as the second uh, um, person. I, perhaps, you know, you can give us some few first and then David can add to it. Okay, okay, no problem. Uh, uh, in alphabetical orders, right? <laughs> 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 
Uh, I think when people talk about investment bank, the uh, immediately we think will be what we have associated probably the job that we did, um, like David and I do, get uh, visit those company, uh, talk to the chairman, the, the CFO, and management team, and help them to do an IPO and get it listed on the exchange, or do this NMA, buy, SS, sell, SF. I mean, this is what we call very traditional, very core part of the investment bank. That's exactly what I'm doing for the time being. But I think investment bank has other divisions as well, as the market said. We have um, um, other departments, including like equity, or some of them would say, call it sales and trading, which basically will be responsible for, uh, we have the company to sell stock. This department, uh, this colleague will help us to um, market the securities to the investor. So we have this department. We also have a department called like uh, asset management, which essentially is manage other people's money, uh, including uh, uh, managing a fund or ETF. Um, obviously, uh, part of the institutional money, we also manage um, personal fund, like um, the wealth management. That's part of also the, the, um, the another major department of uh, an investment bank. Obviously, in the more recent years, people talk about private equity. I think private equity in the past seemed to be a uh, very separate from an investment bank, but you see more and more of that uh, kind of function or department within an investment bank. With CICC, we also have a uh, private equity or what we call CICC capital um, mm -hmm. within, within the group. So I think there are lots of different um, function, and not to say that uh, finance or uh, IT, um, don't see IT as a back office. Um, it's going to be more and more important um, in the investment bank. And one more very important um, function or the, the dep department of investment bank research, because uh, we produce a lot of research report, uh, primarily for the sake of those um, investors to help them to analyze or to get more in-depth understanding of those securities they're going to invest. Apart from that, um, we also have that kind of research which um, talk about the macro environment. So um, these are those major functions that we have in the investment bank. David, David, you have some supplement? Um, Fantastic. Sure. Sure. Um, thank you, Barry. Uh, I think the one thing I want to clarify to the students, and this is quite confusing, so I think perhaps I can explain it a little bit, is the difference between an investment bank and investment banking. So, uh, and I get asked this question all the time. So perhaps I should take this opportunity to explain to uh, many of the audience what it is or the difference between investment bank and investment banking. So the bank itself is an investment bank. So CICC is an investment bank. JP Morgan is an investment bank. Under that or within that bank, that investment bank, you have different uh, key functions you have or departments. You are business lines. You have asset management, you have research, you have uh, private banking, you have trading or markets, and then you have investment banking. So investment banking is one of the key business lines within an investment bank. And then within investment banking, you have different teams. You have uh, m and you have ECM, you have DCM, you have corporate finance, you have derivatives. So when it is a, uh, an IPO or an equity offering, then it would be under ECM, equity capital markets. Mm -hmm. When we are doing a bond, then it would be under DCM, debt capital markets. When do I, we are doing an M&A, then obviously we'd go under M&A. And then when there's a derivative involved, uh, it would be under uh, derivatives. So I wanted to clarify that uh, those different functions within investment banking and within an investment bank. Absolutely. No, like I think you know, it's very important for um, you know, students to, uh, and people who are really interested in getting involved in investment banking and that you know, there are different functions uh, front, middle, back office, and you know, like uh, Barry actually mentioned a little bit about the IT department. It was previously considered as more of a back office job, but then with a lot of trading activities involved in, uh, you know, uh, involving technologies and how, uh, uh, you know, like uh, how, how to write programs and whatnot, perhaps you know, it's going to get more important too. And uh, you know. Uh, 
uh, you, you, David, uh, actually mentioned that there are different product lines and service sure. lines. You know, that is that is very important. And you, I think the students should uh, think about your own strengths and consider which function uh, you can plug right in. So let's say, you know, like if you are really, really good at uh, uh, doing research, uh, you know, like for your coursework, perhaps, you know, think about uh, um, uh, the, 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 the opportunity. Research. Research. Yeah. Uh, exactly, exactly. It. So that is something to consider. Uh, actually, I see quite a few questions coming in. I'm going to address them uh, uh, um, in just a little bit, but then I can't uh, let the gentleman get away from answering me that this question. You, you guys are very busy people. Uh, uh, you know, you have uh, you have a big team to manage. You have a big PNL, a, a big book to uh, also manage, and you have to meet so many clients, and also have a lot of public services uh, commitments. Okay, so um, I would like to see how you actually begin your day, any regular work day. Uh, do you wake up, brush your teeth? Yeah, and that, that that's probably it. But then, what do you do uh, when you first arrive in the office, and and perhaps you know a little bit more about your personal life? Uh, let me now turn to David. I, I can okay. see that you're smiling and okay. being so ready for it. Right. Okay, all right. Uh, so how do I start my work day? I start by reading emails. Um, mm. Every day we get a lot of emails. So uh, that's how I start my day. And But beyond that, I think a typical work day in investment banking is you have a lot of internal meetings. Uh, you have a lot of internal discussion and analysis. You have a lot of client meetings. Uh, and then you need to read a lot of emails and reply a lot of emails and talk to a lot of people. That is a typical workday and what we do in the office. Uh, and, you know, until 12 months ago, obviously, we it involves a lot of traveling as well. We need to go to different places to meet with clients and uh uh, execute transactions to do due diligence, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think beyond that, one thing I can say uh, to all the students about working in investment banking is that uh, it is tough, especially for the juniors. Uh, mm -hmm. It is long hours. It is a lot of pressure. It is tough work, but it is great learning experience. It is very exciting. You will be surrounded by people who are very driven, very smart. I went through that process myself, although many years ago. But one thing I can guarantee is that uh, after all this tough work and long hours and a lot of pressure, you will come out feeling that you are a smarter person after a few years. So it's great training um, in investment banking, in my view. Fantastic, Barry. Yes, I would say that uh, in fact the the day of the work started much earlier. Probably the the uh, the evening um, before, because um, as David said, we have a lot of meetings. We our schedule are basically full. So what I did is um, when I went to bed in the evening, I checked again the schedule next morning, so to make sure that I won't miss those meetings or those call. Or maybe when before the pandemic, those flights. So make sure that I will be able to wake up at the time to catch up all this meeting and and uh, and activities. Oh, and I think um, um, apart from that is more like people say meeting, a call, and meeting clients. As David said, we do the decision, make sure that we know the clients well before we can tell our investor that it is a good company. And I think more importantly is we have always to be prepared for something that we won't expect to change, even though I said that we have this kind of a fully packed schedule. Um, mm -hmm. We are always um, being asked by my bosses, obviously, or some of the clients to have um, an urgent ad hoc meeting. So we have to squeeze, uh, make it up as to um, go into those uh, meetings immediately. Um, uh, as a bank, is. Um, our, our students may think that yes, banking very interesting um, industry because you have a nice hotel to, to stay and fly in business class, fine dining. Um, I would say that is part, maybe part of the um, the so-called the benefit we may have, but more before before we can enjoy that or before we go to that. In fact, it's a very long hour working. Uh, we work round the clock. 
Um, if I, I, I have a meeting with a client and he told me, this is what he told me, he said, um, you have to work seven day work, seven day eight weeks, um, 12 hours, not 24, 12 hours and 365 years. So if our clients are working on that schedule, I would think that he would probably expect that his bankers will work, if not his schedule, more, more and more um, um, a busier schedule than he do. But I do agree with what David said that we have been continuously being challenged by our clients, by our colleagues, uh, by the most smartest people around you. And we found our learning curve um, going very, very steep uh, in the in the banking sectors. And I think this is the the most the most um, um, attractive point that I would see to work in, in an investment bank. Absolutely, you know, I can see that uh, commitment, reaction, uh, diligence, and hard work. Uh, you know, some common themes that come across uh, between the two of you, and uh, what you suggest as you know, like some fundamentals uh, or, or requirements um, um, to 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 own. You know, like in a capacity as an investment banker. But there are also a lot of good uh, things. You know, like you are working with very smart people, diligent people, like a good selves. Um, and also, uh, um, you know, like you are really uh, get, uh, you, you really do get to travel and, you know, broaden your horizon. Um, you know, I pr was previously uh, in uh, an equity research department. I, uh, there was this one time I had to work till 5.30 a.m. And then, you know, like uh, th there was three report announcements in uh, one single day. And, you know, it all came in at 11 uh, p.m. So, you know, like uh, updating the models, writing the reports and, you know, it hit five. Uh, AM, and then I had to go back to the office at 7 AM for the morning meeting. So that is some um, a factual uh, uh, experience. Uh, now you know, like uh, I, uh, we 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 now have around 300 uh, people uh, in the audience, and I have 19 questions with me. <laughs> so uh, let me let me try to summarize some of those questions. Uh, and see if I can bundle them all together. Uh, one of those is uh, in terms of languages. So um, Mandarin, uh, I, I, I see some, um, um, uh, you know, like students coming from Ninan University who uh, is an African student um, and also the other uh, with, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Indian students, they, they are asking a similar question. Is actually Mandarin a, a must in the in investment banking world these days? Uh, why don't I go first? Um, Mandarin is a great to have, but it is not a must. Um, in the office, we have students with uh, a very diversified uh, set of backgrounds. Uh, so we have a lot of my colleagues who don't speak Mandarin because we cover um, not only uh, China, but outside of China as well. So we cover the Korean market, uh, the um, the Southeast Asia market, uh, the uh, Japan market, uh, the Australian market, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot of colleagues who don't speak um, or write uh, Mandarin. Uh, it is good to have because it makes you much more versatile. Uh, that means you can work on more geographic um, um, uh, type of projects, but then again, uh, it is not a must have. Harry? Yeah, I tend, I tend to agree with David that it's not much to have in, in most cases. Um, put it this way, uh, if you, you are going to be a Chinese banker, I mean, I suppose that uh, Mandarin or Chinese is definitely you need that because um, there are a lot of Chinese documents to read on, um, a lot of meeting with your Chinese clan or even Chinese government official. But uh, just before this, um, this sharing, I asked Rocky what languages that we are going to use today. Uh, I think would be Cantonese is in Hong Kong um, um, activities, or would it be Pudonghua, a Mandarin, because uh, we may have some Chinese students here. And then Rocky told me that it's going to be conducted in eight. That might be more important that the investment industry or Hong Kong is more than Hong Kong itself. If you, you can term it Cantonese means Hong Kong, we are not just working here for Hong Kong. Uh, then is it Chinese put on what? Not that neither. We are working more globally until one day, I think when you one day uh, put on what Chinese becoming international languages, which had not been yet. So we continue to use English. So I think more importantly is that 
we need people who will be able to um, um, work across different cultures. Uh, international background is very helpful. Uh, even though I would say that CSC, we started as a Chinese investment bank, obviously most of our clients are uh, Chinese clients or one way or the other related to China. But we are expanding, there are also many other banks like CSC. We are expanding uh, to places that uh, don't speak Chinese. Like we, we will have our offices, new, uh, a new office in, in Japan. Uh, we have, we will, bring, we, we will fetch office um, in, in India. Uh, we are, already have um, offices in New York, London, and quite a lot of our, our, staff, uh, our staff that they, they don't speak um, Chinese. Uh, even in Beijing, we do have some colleagues that who only speak English. So that is the, um, everybody will have their, their role to play. Um, with in Chinese, some we really need those people uh, with national background or cross cultural experiences to help to do business. Absolutely. You know, like international experience is um, something at the heart of, you know, like Hong Kong's success as an international financial center. Um, you know, like Mark, if, if I may chip in uh, as well, you know, like Mandarin is absolutely important. You know, like uh, Mina, as Mandarin speaking population uh, is representation of at least 20 percent of uh, the, the global uh, population. So, you know, like that tells you how important it is to speak Mandarin. But then uh, English is also a language that is spoken by you know, a huge amount, a huge portion of the world's population too. So, you know, like uh, mastering uh, uh, these languages would be uh, Im immensely important. I come across this question also from the student, if I may, uh, is that, you know, like, can someone elaborate what, uh, you know, like the corporate finance uh, department does? You know, obviously, uh, some, some people uh, may mix up the finance department in the corporate First is, you know, like what corporate finance does. So uh, perhaps if someone can uh, take on that question and, and try to explain to um, uh, the, the, the question raiser. Uh, we now have 37 questions. So, you know, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, um, you know, address all the questions, but I, I'll select some of them and try to summarize the others. So uh, corporate finance. Um, uh, I'll go first. Uh, corporate finance. So corporate finance is not the finance department uh, of an investment <laughs> bank. So corp what corporate finance does now, uh, different investment banks may have different interpretation uh, of the word corporate finance or the corporate finance department. Corporate finance 20 years ago means something that might be slightly different from what corporate finance means today. But typically what the corporate finance department does is particularly in an IPO, they would be responsible for the due diligence, for the documentation, uh, for the uh, dealing with the stock exchange and doing many of the analysis uh, that is not industry specific. Um, another setup, uh, if I can elaborate a little bit more, within an investment banking department, there are different industry teams mm -hmm. that specialize in, for example, uh, TMT, uh, mm -hmm. telecom media and uh, technology or specialize mm -hmm. in um, uh, uh, consumer retail uh, sector. So there are different industry teams or sector teams. And then there is a general corporate finance team that did what I mentioned earlier, the general analysis, documentation, due diligence, particularly in an IPO. So mm -hmm. that is what the corporate finance team does. Um, Barry, do you have any different uh, interpretation? Uh, yes, I want to add maybe one more is so when I study corporate finance in the university, what we study is all this NPV, IRR, um, um, cash flow, um, or the, um, the um, um, cap and model, but neither, neither, not to say neither. Few of them we use here in the so-called corporate finance department in the investment bank. In fact, in CICC, we don't have a department called corporate finance, but um, in terms of the job or the role that um, some of my colleagues are playing as to what David has said, basically we do um, like the, the, the um, dealing with the stock exchange or, or the uh, due diligence and so forth. And as I said, different banks have different setup. As I said, CICC don't have a Corporate finance department, but most of our colleagues, in fact, they are also doing kind of work for people usually determined as corporate finance. 
And uh, one thing that, apart from firm finance or, or a sector team or the industrial team, and I also want to add is that many people prefer um, a team, of, a group of people in the investment call, call them client team or client coverage, which sound mm -hmm. that um, they do not they just go to do dining, drinking, or shopping. I can tell you that this client coverage is not that. <laughs> don't don't be don't be um, illusioned that um, it's just an easy job. Um, in fact, you have to. Client coverage is not a good term in my in, in my world, but let me say a good service team. Because whenever client think about their need, it could be because of some of those uh, rules related. Uh, they they need someone who really understand the rules, the law. That you may say that's bringing the company finance team to come in. But maybe the client come in with very sector industry specific. Um, they might want to merge with another same sector's company. We probably need to draw not just the legal term, but legal colleague, but also the colleague really understand the sector, the future development sector. So we need to grow, understand both legal background as well as the sectors. And then you have some math where they can make good economic sense. So I think. Um, being a good corporate, being a good um, coverage banker is more than just again. I want to my student, our student, to do good, go good restaurant, good fine dining. You need really, really need to go back to the basic, as you know, all of this detail stuff. Absolutely, you know, like although we, although we do do fine dining. <laughs> yes, after deal close. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, like, I, I have to write on this. Um, we do find a fine dining, and that is the perks. And right? uh, that, that would be the perks of this glamorous uh, investment banker uh, position. Uh, what, are, what are the downsides? You know, like, uh, I, I understand that you mentioned uh, there are quite some requirements, right? Uh, what are some other downsides that you see? Um, uh, or, you know, like, especially for junior uh, bankers, you know, like, because, you know, the people who are in the audience today are uh, uh, students and they must go through some hurdles before uh, they can reach a position like yours. So uh, what, what are some uh, potential downside risk uh, as uh, being a, um, you know, investment banker? Okay. Well, I would say, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it is long hours. You need to, especially for uh, junior bankers, you would need to work very long hours. Uh, you would uh, need to work uh, under a lot of pressure. Uh, it is a tough job. The expectation uh, is very high. Um, but again, uh, it is amazing learning experience and it gives you the kind of job satisfaction that is probably difficult to get elsewhere. So um, there are some downside, but I think that, that it is great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that it's, yeah, again, I agree that this is a very, very interesting and um, very steep learning curve job. Um, if there are any downside, I don't know, the worst you get sacked. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very competitive, frankly speaking, very competitive yes. in banking sectors. Everybody, every student come in. Um, if not, they, you, you name it, they, a lot of them, like I believe, or those um, 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 first honor student, um, even PhD, they join as a, a uh, Cambridge Recruit student. So everybody, very smart people are working together. And at the end of the year, is, um, suddenly we have this performance appraisal. Uh, and um, I guess um, our student um, would heard that um, ranking goes from number one to number bottom. Those at the bottom will face the risk being um, dismissed. And I, this is really the downside. But even, even there is such a downside, why so many people coming in to investment bank, apart from Rockage, you mentioned this fund dining, I think more importantly is because of the, um, the competitive brand, uh, environment, uh, we have always been challenged uh, to stay in something new, to break through, to make some breakthrough. So I think that kind of satisfaction, uh, that kind of um, steep learning curve, as I said in the very beginning, is the very attractive, the attractiveness 
of staying in the bank. Absolutely, you know, the risk and reward, and it is a, a very, then striking the right equilibrium uh, is very, very important. And th this is clearly shown uh, in uh, this job as an investment banker. Um, I understand that, you know, like a lot of investment banking professionals have uh, different qualifications, uh, masters, doctorate, um, you know, CFA, ACCA, CPA, and whatnot. You know, a, a lot of people feel that uh, the opportunity for, uh, uh, for them to join this banking industry is positively correlated uh, to the degrees that they hold, the number of degrees or, or qualifications that they possess. Uh, is that correct? You know, like, is, is it very important to hold a master or doctorate or CFA, ACCA, CPA, et cetera, uh, before joining the industry? Uh, maybe I can start first there, if you can supplement. Um, um, I don't think so. Um, we, as I said, um, I just had friends another round of um, New Cambridge School um, two weeks ago, and it's just, I saw quite a diversified of background of majoring. And some of them have taken the CFA, some maybe in the process, some haven't started yet. Um, some of them will study in finance, in economics, and as I said, some would be in architectures or engineering. I think more important as far as we're concerned is um, you get to satisfy two level of people. Um, from the mid-level bankers, is to, for the students come in, they are the junior. And then we have some mid-level and so far the senior and deep. Um, you get to satisfy the middle level because the middle level uh, man manager are uh, more likely to look into whether those junior, the new bankers come in, have the so-called basic knowledge about banking or about the basic uh, rules and regulation uh, or the cap elements. So mm -hmm. we get satisfied that level, but when for the senior bankers, what the senior bankers is more likely to see is um, whether you have so good get the potential. Um, I think more importantly is for our students to be able to demonstrate that they are able to work under high pressure. They are very committed, uh, very committed to succeed, and they are willing to take up challenges and um, be able to change this whenever some challenges come in. Um, I think that's a um, piece of my advice to, to, our, to our student. Mm -hmm. David? Uh, agreed. And uh, uh, of course, it's absolutely great to be knowledgeable. Uh, so it's good to have a CFA or law degree or accounting degree and other uh, knowledges, but there is a diminishing return Mm. Uh, of getting more degrees. So if you have three degrees, it doesn't mean you are three times more likely to be hired than someone with one degree. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, Barry has already mentioned that, you know, like the ability to work under pressure, uh, the commitment that, you know, one demonstrates and also uh, the ability as a problem solver uh, would be some key qualities uh, that he would look for in hiring uh, a professional or a fresh graduate. David, uh, perhaps you know you can uh, tell me a little bit, or us rather, uh, a little bit about the qualities that you will look for in uh, your new hires. Yeah, I think the quite similar to what Barry was mentioning, uh, the the strong desire to uh, to to succeed, uh, being able to work under pressure, uh, mm -hmm. interpersonal skills that's very mm -hmm. important, interpersonal skill or communication skills because you need to be able to present your idea articulate your idea very clearly, uh, whether internally or to the, uh, to, to the clients. So I think the, again, those are the qualities that uh, we would be looking for um, when we do I, recruiting. Yeah. Seems and, and, nice. and if I can add one more point, which is uh, critical thinking, uh, mm -hmm. see beyond the surface as to what is behind many of the uh, issues or problems that we look at. So critical thinking is another point that I would add. Thank you. That's it for thought for the students who are interested in this uh, very interesting sector. Um, now, let me turn to uh, uh, other questions that I received uh, from um, 
uh, uh, well, actually, how the, it, it seems to me that you know this is a very challenging job, and I, I'm sure you know like no one would disagree uh, from the audience. Uh, very long hours, uh, you know, like and and there are you know like a, a lot of uncertain situations that you know like people have to uh, walk through. So, how do you manage the pressure? You know, like uh, how do, uh, you know, we, we mentioned how you start your workday reading emails. Do you do any sports at all? You know, like how, how do you strike the balance between, you know, spending time with uh, your loved ones, friends, and, you know, here at work? Um, that, that, that's a bundle of questions. So yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think um, Rocky said that uh, keeping healthy definitely is a must. Um, that's safe to time work. Uh, what I do uh, more often is uh, I do jogging, I do running, I have some, that is the basic sport. Um, if I do have time during the weekend, maybe play um, some ball games, tennis and so forth. Um, are you, going back to your question about how to manage the pressure, I think what I did or many of our fellow bankers would do is uh, we work really with a pure heart, with a good intention, because we, we work with good intention, pure heart, good motives, we have nothing to worry. Mm. What we really worry is really worry about oh, the where the market will go down, um, 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 whether this stock will, will, will start attractive, but we are not worrying something that um, will hurt people, that will, 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 will hurt the investors and so forth. So I think, when we started with a pure heart, with good intent and good motive, I sleep well. So I think that's also another sort of thing. One is the physical health and the other is the mental health. Okay. David? Um, I have a short answer to that question. So it is a job that has a lot of pressure. Uh, number one, you get used to it after a while. <laughs> and number two, I play golf. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, getting used to it is very important. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess uh, between you know, like um, being new to it and getting used to it, you know, there, there's a phase. You know, there's a time that uh, you, you have to pick up the learning curve. Um, now, I would like to uh, ask another question uh, in relation to your career. So there must be a lot of uh, interactions that you have had with your uh, seniors. You know, like you guys are already head of the IBD department. Um, but I would like to see if, if there was any specific moment, that one specific moment that you can't get rid of uh, in your mind, uh, that you, 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 that the exchange that you had with your uh, boss, uh, very, you know, like memorable uh, experience that you have uh, with your either current or uh, previous boss. Sure. So, can I, can I go first? Please do. Can I go first? Okay. I still have this incident in my mind, even though it has been way more than 10 years. Um, so it was the one evening uh, I was, you know, working on something, obviously. And um, I made some serious mistake. It was like 1 a.m. in the morning. I was the only one in the office. I, you know, made a mistake that uh, is something that needed to be delivered the next morning. Okay. And it was a bad mistake. It was a, you know, it wasn't good. It was bad. And uh, so I had no choice. I needed to call my boss and explain to him that I made a mistake. He did not yell at me. He took time to explain to me what I should do in order to fix that mistake. Um, and I am grateful to that incident till this day because he didn't yell at me. Uh, but I felt very guilty. And at that moment <laughs> in time, I promised myself that I would never make that mistake again. And I still remember that incident till this day. Passive aggressive. Uh, that's what my wife told me. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> she doesn't yell at me, uh, you know, when I make mistake and then, you know, like I would remember it all day. Um, <laughs> Barry. Um, just want to um, echo what David said. Uh, you remind me in saying, uh, I probably have forgot the exact wordings, but it's more like when you have this uh, disagreement or uh, anger, don't express your anger, but explain. Explain why you disagree, explain why you are disappointed. So I think really it's um, kind of Buddhist, 
push them that we all have to learn. Um, yeah, there are a lot, of thing, a lot of mistakes that we have done before, a lot of um, something that I did, which is not up to standard as far as the clients or the boards are concerned. But frankly speaking, most of which I have forgotten. Um, um, not, just, not because that I don't think that wasn't, there, were, there wasn't any mistake, but um, I took the approaches that uh, let's, let, let's uh, take it and then, um, oh yeah, why not? Um, maybe I can just give one example is um, my boss and I went to call a client and, we, and then we found out that um, the, the client is very resourceful. He know everybody, he know even most of the stuff that we know. And then I told my boss that so he, he know everything. Uh, he even know that those so-called the potential buyers of his business, um, there's no no chance that we can get a deal from him because uh, if there is any, any opportunity, possibly this chairman will be able to talk directly with um, those potential buyers. And, um, and in fact, the chairman, the company told me that to us that, um, yeah, if you don't need you, then we left the office and I told my boss, uh, no, no chance. And my boss immediately, not to scold on me, but to um, touch me a lesson. Um, you shouldn't take it that way. Uh, even he said that, do you want to do the business? Do you want to do the business? Then he's saying it the other way. How to stay more um, critically or more um, 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 opening as to what other solutions that you may have. So I got the, um, first of all, the motto is that we be cha always challenged and always be prepared to be challenged. So um, there's nothing so called that we can't make it, but at least we have to try it. Uh, only after we have 501% of our effort, then we know the result. Otherwise, you won't say that um, we cannot do that. Absolutely, I can't agree more. Um, I went through the 61 questions that I received from the audience. Uh, uh, one of those, I'm sure, is from my mentee. Uh, Adrian Chan from uh, Open University, and that is about, and that is really the, the, the very single question about uh, COVID. So, how did COVID actually change your job? Uh, and you know, like uh, in terms of deal flows, in terms of the nature of job, in terms of traveling and whatnot. Uh, this is a very excellent question, and perhaps you know, like an extension of that is, are you guys still hiring in terms, of, uh, you know, amid uh, COVID? and the challenges is it posed. So, um, David? Sure. Um, so how did COVID change uh, the way we work? Uh, number one, I did not know what was Zoom, uh, <laughs> but now <laughs> I use Zoom every day. Number two, I used to travel uh, outside of Hong Kong two times a week. Oh, yeah. Now I have not left Hong Kong Island, well, <laughs> Hong Kong, <laughs> for, for almost one year. Uh, but having said that, uh, business have been uh, picking up um, in the past one year, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. So business have been good. Uh, and uh, in a way, we have been much more efficient because we did not have to travel uh, as much. Well, we did not have to travel at all <laughs> in the past uh, <laughs> uh, 12 months. Uh, so we saved a lot of time. Uh, and in uh, uh, as a sort of side effect, we have uh, saved a lot of uh, costs as well in the past 12 months because we didn't have to travel. Uh, but of course, it doesn't mean that we will never have to travel again. I think once the travel restrictions are being relaxed, uh, we will be traveling again. But what the, uh, the COVID situation has proved to uh, uh, many of us is that there are more efficient ways to conduct business and it's been mm. proven that it can be done. Mm, mm, absolutely. Barry, um, your view? Yes, I think I'm more or less uh, uh, quite uh, like uh, for David did. Um, I haven't fly for, 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 for in the last 12 months, so um, something that we have never been able to imagine. And um, when we in the past used to fly at least one uh, or even twice a week, um, um, you answer your question, Rocky, that are we still hiring? I told you that we, um, I did interview some of our campus recruit um, uh, two weeks ago. So we continue to hire. Um, there's a lot of business opportunity coming on. 
um, uh, especially on finance, on credit market. Uh, when I think we get to, we have to admit that, that China continues to grow uh, in its economy, and we still see a lot of bright futures for the economy, if not globally, at least uh, in this part of the region. And um, even in the pandemic, I, I think we won't we won't be able to. Um, meet our client, meet our colleague uh, physically, but um, soon um, this kind of video conversations happen a lot. This brings me to remind us again that uh, what's banking or in general what relationship really matters is we have to communicate. Um, in the past, we communicate more often uh, face to face, person to person, but um, even during the pandemic, this uh, video conversations or should soon or have a conference continue to happen. Because we know that without communication, there's no relationship. And I think with this communication, hopefully uh, through the communication, we'll be able to build respect. And mm -hmm. I won't say that we have love with clients, but uh, respect eventually means that we'll be able to deal with others more on a friendly basis. And on that, we'll be able to build a first case um, banking or investment banking, I think the theme is still on trust. Um, clients trust on us. We trust on the client, then we have a deal. Otherwise, there's no, no transaction, no deal. So I think even on pandemic, um, it won't change some of those fundamental communicate, respect, and trust. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Rocky, can I? Can, <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to make that point uh, as a reminder. Um, I think for many of the U.S. investment banks, the uh, the recruitment process really start two years before you start your job. So there is a sort of protocol in place. What you do is uh, 12 months before the summer, you start to apply for the summer internship. Uh, and then when you get into the summer internship, that is the pool where we would make offers for the uh, uh, for the um, incoming class the following year. So mm -hmm. again, the process really starts uh, two years before you actually start your job. So a reminder for the students that if you are interested in uh, investment banking or in investment bank in general, uh, you need to start early. You need to start really early. Fantastic. I see a lot of questions coming in uh, that, and those are really related to, uh, you know, like how uh, the, the different functions would vary in uh, private equity, uh, uh, venture capital, hedge fund, etc. Those would be a separate topic, and we are going to talk about that in the uh, next session or two. Uh, so, you know, we're going to focus more on the investment banking side of things. And this very last question is related to the last one that you guys mentioned, and it is about technology. How is technology playing a role in investment banking now? Uh, uh, you know, we are running out of time. Just, uh, you know, a short answer uh, to this very difficult question. So I'll start with Barry. Uh, very important <laughs> and going to be more important. Mm, thank you. That has <laughs> sustained. And then, uh, David, what do you think? Technology. Well, it makes us work even harder. Uh, again, uh, with Zoom and uh, many of the uh, uh, communication systems and all that, uh, we are more efficient, but then mm -hmm. again, we need to work even harder. Uh, so that's technology's impact uh, on our job. Fantastic. So now it comes to five o'clock and, you know, that really means that we are going to end our uh, session uh, right on time. Uh, on behalf of the FSDC and also uh, gentlemen that we have, uh, Mr. Barry Chan and Mr. David Lau from CICC and JP Morgan respectively, uh, I would like to thank you guys for joining us and really look forward to you joining us again uh, for the next session about uh, various industries. So thank you for joining and thanks for your time. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Rafi.